Thank you, Brother Fabian. Thank you to the worship team. Since kind of a theme going through uh, our worship so far today, a lot of praise, a lot of joy, a lot of rejoicing in our reading from Isaiah, our reading from the Psalms, uh, our reading from Philippians. It's just an uplifting time. I think the Lord was, uh, was wise in preparing us all for a, a tough topic today. Last week, I gave a pretty pointed sermon about what's wrong with the world today. Entitlement, victim mentality, being too easily offended, and selfishness. I know that sermon was a little bit abrupt, and it may have caught some of you off guard, but it was definitely what I felt impressed to preach. And the devil fought me on it, too. I got to tell you, preparing for last week's sermon, there were a few times when I was very much inclined to choose an easier topic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but the Spirit let me know that wasn't going to fly. I wasn't going to get off the hook. I felt impressed to give the sermon I gave last week, just as I felt impressed to give the sermon I'm giving this week. Now, last week, you remember, we talked about closed-mindedness. We talked about rhetoric instead of discussion. We talked about the blame game that people play, the destruction of the work ethic, the rise of offensiveness everywhere, everybody's offended by everything, and the hypocrisy and the judgmentalism of the world today. That was last week. Pretty heavy stuff. Well, this week's sermon is on what's wrong with the church today. But I already gave it last week. <laughs> How uncomfortable was that for just a second? <sighs> Anybody feel a little bit of that discomfort when I sat down? <laughs> Good, and I don't mean that in a mean way. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you that when the sermon was put into my heart... <laughs> I felt just as uncomfortable, if not more so, than any of you might have felt just a minute ago. Because it's hard to face what we're doing wrong. For us as human beings, it is difficult for us to be called out and to face the things that we need to do better at. And I bet that several of you, as we listened to last week's sermon, probably had in your mind someone who yet last week's sermon applied to, right? <laughs> Some of us might have even seen ourselves <laughs> in the sermon, but I bet everybody had somebody in mind. But how many of you, and you don't need to raise your hands because it's a rhetorical question, but how many of you really did hear yourself and realize the things that applied to you in last week's sermon? That's where it gets tough. Sometimes we put the blinders on. Sometimes we put the blinders on intentionally. But it's hard for us to face the things that we're doing wrong. And that's a normal, natural, human condition. It's hard for all of us human beings. Unfortunately, for us Christians, it can cause us to develop a sort of spiritual blindness. And that spiritual blindness, that tendency to take for granted that we're okay, we're Christians, we're saved, we're not doing anything wrong. And it's only the rest of the world that needs to shape up and fly right. That's at the heart of what's really wrong with the church today. Romans 11.25 says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. Now, this admonition is speaking to spiritual blindness, pointing out that the Jews had turned a blind eye to their Messiah. We can be blinded just as easily as the Jews were by becoming wise in our own minds, instead of seeking wisdom where it is to be found, we become blind to the errors of our ways and the truth 
of God's way. Now, I'm not talking today just to our little church, although this sermon was given to me to preach to this church. I'm talking about what's wrong with the universal church today all around the world, including our little church. And in our main reading today, Paul is speaking to the same issues that I'll be speaking to today. Paul gives a very constructive missive to the church at Philippi. This is Philippians chapter 2. We'll read the first four verses, then we'll skip down to verse 12. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights to the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. What a beautiful picture Paul paints of what the church is supposed to be. Pastor Greg, why on earth would you have chosen that reading for what's wrong with the church today? This is how church is supposed to be. But I want you to ask yourselves honestly in your hearts right now, is this how church is? Is this what we're doing? You see, that wonderful passage we just read concludes with a challenge, a plea, really. Walk blameless in the world among all the godless, is what he's saying. Shine in your words, in your deeds, in how you treat other people. And for crying out loud, walk the walk, he says. Hold fast the word of life, to quote him directly, so that Paul's preaching won't be in vain. And I very much want to add my voice to his because I don't want my preaching to be in vain either. Now, I'm going to try to hit on all the points that Paul brought up in these passages from Philippians, but can I first say that the most subtle, the most pervasive problem in the church today isn't divisiveness, which is a huge problem, and we're going to talk about it, and it isn't hypocrisy or pride or selfishness or self-centeredness or a lack of charity or a rebellious, crooked, perverse generation of Christians. We're going to address all of those real and present dangers for sure. But contributing to all of those issues, and they exist, make no mistake, contributing to all of them is the fact that as much as we get upset talking about the separation of church and state... Most Christians today, and this is a bold statement, most Christians today live their lives in a state of separation of church and life. Think about it. We may be full-on, full all-out Christians on Sunday. We may rock the Bible study on Wednesday night. We may attend six or seven meetings a week. Participate in church activities every single week. But in between all of those activities, all of those meetings, all of those worship services on Sundays and Bible studies on Wednesday night, a lot of us have the tendency to switch into a different mode of living. A worldly state of mind and our consciousness hardly ever turns to God 
when we're in that state. It's like we have two lives. One is our walk with Christ, and that walk may be sincere, and it may be enriching, and it may be spirit-filled. But the other is our daily life, which, like we talked about last week, will generally conform to the ways of the world around it. Unless we blend those two into one life, one life with Jesus Christ at the center, like Jesus taught his disciples to do in Luke 9.23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He didn't say, in order to follow me, just keep doing what you're doing, except that at the appointed church times, take up his cross on Sunday or on Wednesday night. He said he needs to forsake the natural man, forsake himself, take up his cross daily, be willing to struggle with that cross in this fight against the flesh and follow him, follow Jesus' example. That's what he tells us to do. And that means thinking about Jesus even when you're at work. That means thinking about Jesus even when you're brushing your teeth, going to the grocery store. Christ needs to be at the center of our whole life, not just our spiritual walk. Otherwise, this separation of church and life that people tend to fall into will kill the progress of God's work in his church. What's wrong with the church today? It's tempting to look at the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, but we've had that sermon series already. <laughs> but the one of those letters the Spirit just wouldn't let me let go of this week is the letter to the church at Laodicea. Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish, I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I know I brought it up in that sermon when we did the seven letters, but I'll tell you again, Jesus is saying, I would rather you be 100% against me or 100% for me, which of course he wants us all. But to be middle of the road, to be lukewarm about it, that's worse. That's worse than being opposed to him. And the powerful statement about lukewarmness. Lukewarm Christianity is just as big a problem today as it was in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago, if not bigger. I'm not talking about your passion for Jesus when you're here at church on Sundays or your fiery love for the gospel when you are taking time to read your scriptures, if we're taking time to read our scriptures every day. I don't doubt that each and every one of you here in this room loves Jesus. Our lukewarm attitude has nothing to do with our feelings of love for Jesus, but it has to do with what we do with those feelings. It has to do with our actions. How do we show Jesus in every area of our lives how much we love him? That's where we get lukewarm, isn't it? Are we on fire for Jesus every time we have an opportunity to witness to a fallen sinner? Are we rearing to go when an opportunity for service presents itself? Are we impossible to keep down when there's hard and unpleasant work to be done for the Lord? Or are we lukewarm? Is there always something that can distract us or get in the way of our active service? Or use up all of our energy so that there's nothing left at the end of the day to give to the Lord when we're called upon to serve others? or even making us bitter and jaded so that we're not motivated to serve others. 
what's wrong with the church today, we've become lukewarm in our service, in our actions. And unfortunately, that gives non-believers the impression that we don't live what we preach. It smacks of a really big what's wrong with the church today, which is hypocrisy. We have Jesus Christ. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can see the fruits of the gospel in our lives. We know the things we're supposed to be doing. When it comes right down to it, we're still human. We're still subject to the weaknesses of our flesh. And that weakness leads us to a form of hypocrisy in how we feel about and even treat other people. 1 John 4.20 If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? See, this weakness of our flesh leads us to hypocrisy. We, we talk about love all the time. The Bible's main theme is the love of God. But that hypocrisy that we fall into keeps us from seeing our own sins but having no trouble at all seeing them in others. Matthew 7, 5, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This weakness of our flesh leads us into this hypocrisy in the form of judgmentalism. The belief that because we're Christians, we're better than other people. Or because of our practice, we're better than other Christians. We become gossipy, backbiting, snobbish examples of all the behaviors that Jesus warned us about. Romans 14, 13, let, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Because that's what's wrong with the church today. We've become the stumbling block for each other because we get ensnared in the drama and the blame and the victim mentality that the rest of the world practices. Well, so-and-so said this, I'm not going <laughs> to... We also become a stumbling block to the unsaved because when they look to us to see whether or not the church is the answer to all of the things we talked about last week that are wrong with the world today... They don't like what they see. They see the same problems in the church that they see everywhere else. I don't know if you've read the statistics, but divorce rates aren't any different anymore between Christians and non-Christians. Domestic violence, not any different among Christians than non-Christians. And I'm almost tempted to put Christians in quotation marks. But we're happy to show up on Sunday, sing a few hymns, say a few prayers, study God's Word for a little while feel like we've done our Christian duty. Why then are people all around the world leaving churches in droves? Why are church membership and especially church attendance at an all-time low? There's a really powerful letter that was written a few years ago by a pastor, Pastor John Pavlovitz in Wake Forest, Illinois. And he sent it out. It's an open letter to the church. He sent it out to various publications. It made Christianity Today and Church Plants and a couple other, uh, a couple other major Christian sources. I'm going to read not the whole letter because it's fairly long, but I want to read enough of this letter that you get the point that he was making. It's not scripture that I'll be reading from here, but I think the message is a timely one. So as a church, let's listen to this letter from the world to us. <coughs> Dear church, want to know why people are leaving the church? Really leaving? Being on the other side of the exodus stinks, doesn't it? 
I see the panic on your face, church. I know the internal terror as you see the statistics and hear the stories and scan the exit polls. I see you desperately scrambling to do damage control for the fence sitters and manufacture passion from the shrinking faithful. And I want to help you. You may think you know why people are leaving you, but I'm not sure you do. You think it's because the culture is so lost, so perverse, so beyond help that they are all walking away. You believe that they've turned a deaf ear to the voice of God, chasing money and sex and material things. You think that the gays and the Muslims and the atheists and the pop stars have so screwed up the morality of this world that everyone is abandoning faith in droves. But those aren't the reasons people are leaving the church. They aren't the problem, church. You are. Now, love seems to be a pretty big deal to you, but we're not getting that when the rubber meets the road. In fact, more and more, your brand of love seems incredibly selective and decidedly narrow, filtering out all the spiritual riffraff, which sadly includes far too many of us. It feels like a big bait and switch, a sucker deal, advertising, come as you are party, but then letting us know once we're in the door that you can't really come as you are. We see a Jesus in the Bible who hung out with lowlifes and prostitutes and outcasts and loved them right there. But that doesn't seem to be your cup of tea, church. Can you love us if we don't check all the doctrinal boxes and don't have our theology all figured out? It doesn't seem to us that you can. Can you love us if we cuss and drink and get tattoos and, God forbid, vote Democrat? We're doubtful. Can you love us if we're not sure how we define love and marriage and heaven and hell? It sure doesn't feel like it to us. From what we know about Jesus, we think he looks like love. The unfortunate thing is you don't look much like him. That's part of the reason people are leaving the church. These words may get you really, really angry, and you may want to jump in with a knee-jerk move to defend yourself or attack these positions line by line, but we hope that you won't. We hope that you'll sit in stillness with these words for a while because whether you believe they're right or wrong, they're real to us. And that's the whole point. I'm here in my flawed, screwed-up, wounded, shell-shocked, doubting, disillusioned meanness that I've been waiting for you to step in with this whole supposedly relentless, audacious love of Jesus. This thing I hear so much about, and I'm waiting for you to make it real for me. Church, I know how much you despise the word tolerance, but right now I really need you to tolerate me, to tolerate those of us who, for all sorts of reasons, you may feel aren't justified, we're struggling to stay. We're weary of feeling like nothing more than a religious agenda, an argument to win, a point to make, a cause to defend, a soul to save. We want to be more than a notch on your salvation belt, another number to pad your Twitter posts at the end of your stat sheets. We need to be more than just altar call props who are applauded and, and high-fived down the aisle and then forgotten once the hymn ends. We've been praying for you to stop evangelizing us and preaching at us and fighting us and judging us and sin diagnosing us long enough to simply hear us. Even if we are the problem, even if we are the woman in adultery or the doubting follower or the rebellious prodigal or the demon-riddled young man, we can't be anything else right now in this moment. And in this moment, we need a church big enough and tough enough and loving enough, not just for us as we might one day be then, but for us as we are now. We still believe that God is big enough and tough enough and loving enough, even if you won't be. And that's why even if we do walk away, it doesn't mean we're walking away from faith. It's just that faith right now seems more reachable somewhere else.
So yes, church, even if you're right, and even if we're totally wrong, even if we're all petty, self-centered, and hypocritical, and critical, and I'll say it, sinful, we're still the ones searching for a place where we can be known and belong, a place where it feels like God lives. And you're the ones who can show it to us. Even if the problem is me, it's me who you're supposed to be reaching. Church, so for the love of God, reach already. Some powerful stuff. And I know that's a lot. And I know that parts of that are biting. It wasn't pleasant, at least for me, when I realized the ways in which I too have contributed to that frustration that, yes, this was written by a pastor, but I believe it was written by a pastor who understood the frustrations of the people in the world who look to us to see if the truth is here. And we know it is, but how are we sharing that with them? Part of why it's so hard for us as human beings to face what we're doing wrong and what's wrong with the church, our churches today is the other utter hypocrisy of human pride, which is an offshoot of that self-centeredness that I talked about last week that's wrong with the world. See, we're not exempt from the world's follies and frailties. The problem, of course, is that as we learned about Nebuchadnezzar in our Wednesday night Bible study, pride puts us at opposition with God takes us away from how he wants us to be the example in this world. James 4, 6, second half of the verse, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If we're so proud of our Christianity, so proud of our morals and values, we can't be touting that. We can't be puffed up and haughty and in judgment of the world because God opposes that. That's not how Jesus ministered. Now, James was quoting Proverbs there, and actually the verses before the one he quotes are just as important to our discussion today. So we'll read Proverbs 3, verses 32 through 35. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. For walking in his ways, we have God's instructions and directions. Verse 33, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. When we're repentant, when we're working on our sanctification every day, we have blessings. When we're wicked, the curse of the Lord is upon us. Verse 34 is the one James was quoting. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. Now James paraphrased it. James said God resists the proud, but in this uh, translation of Proverbs, it's he scorns the scornful, and that speaks to our judgmentalism. If you're going to be out there scorning other people for their sins and their faults and their specks of sawdust in their eyes, you can fully expect God to be scorning you for the beams in your own eyes. And then, of course, verse 35, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Part of why it's so hard for us to face the things that we might be doing wrong is because of the shame that we feel. It's not pleasant to be convicted. It's not pleasant for us to be ashamed of the ways we've lived our lives. What's wrong with the world today? What's wrong with the church today? Sorry. We've chosen the foolishness of the world over the wisdom of God. I think we're ashamed of it, which makes us not want to face it. We've chosen the foolishness of the world's ways over the sometimes difficult and arduous, but right and true ways of God. And that's caused complacency, and it's caused lukewarmness, and it's caused hypocrisy, and it's caused judgmentalism, and the continued state of sin within the church divisiveness within the church, judgmentalism of each other in the church and of everybody else outside the church. It's caused the foolishness of pride. The church, like the world today, is just too focused on the self, 
the me, and all of the hypocrisy, all of the judgmentalism, all of the inaction and complacency, these are all tied to a worldly focus, a self-focus. And lifting yourself above, even subconsciously lifting yourself above God by putting the focus on you instead of putting the focus on God, that's the height of pride. That's idolatry. The only cure for this, for us individually and for us as a church, is humility. We have to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God's will, to God's authority in our lives. We have to be willing to accept responsibility for our shortcomings, repent of the ways in which we fall short. We have to be willing to look at what makes us uncomfortable. We have to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God's will for our lives individually and as a church. James 4, verses 7 through 10. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Now that's not to say that we're supposed to be gloomy all the time. That's not what that verse is saying. But we do need to accept humility and the ways in which God humbles us in our lives. We do need to recognize that if we're doing things that make us feel good, all the time, if we're seeking that comfort and that pleasure and that indulgence of the world, that perhaps we are out of alignment with God's will. He will bless us when we seek Him, but He never promised it's going to be sunshine and roses and chocolate all the time. What's wrong with the church today? It's dying. I've shared some of the statistics with you. In our county alone, 75% of residents of Coos County, Oregon, do not attend church at all. 75%. Staggering. People are leaving the church in droves. We're not going to breathe new life into the church by celebrating ourselves, by resting on our laurels, on just thanking God for the fact that we're saved and quietly sitting here just on Sundays and praising Him for it. We have got to submit ourselves to God, resist the temptations of our flesh because that's the only way we're going to get the devil to flee from us. We've got to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, living sacrifice. We're not talking about putting ourselves on an altar talking about going out every single day in everything that we do and working for the Lord, giving ourselves as a reasonable sacrifice to God, doing what we can do every single day to serve Him in everything that we do. We have to submit ourselves to God in that way, that deeply, with that much humility. We've got to humble ourselves in the sight of our God and Father. And I pray that as we do, not just our little church, but the universal church of all believers all around the world, I pray that the Lord will lift up His church and renew His church and bring revival to His church for His glory, for His honor, for His praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We're going to raise our voices in song now.